really love that analogy for genome editing because it really is, in fact, what genome editing is all about. So we can think of the genome, which is the DNA found in a cell that has all of the instructions for making a cell or a whole organism. And uh, we can think of that information like the information in a book or maybe better, an encyclopedia. And uh, what scientists have been trying to do now for decades, honestly, is to understand the information content of the genome, and particularly the human genome. Mm -hmm. And what CRISPR does is to give scientists an incredibly precise and programmable tool for altering the code to identify and cut specific DNA sequences. And we can control which sequences it's cutting. We can decide how to program it and, and have it go to that place in the genome, just like you might thumb to a page in a, a book volume and you know, change a word or a, a paragraph and, or move, it or move things around. And it's, it actually is cutting and pasting information in the DNA. Do you remember what it looked like when you sort of connected the dots? Were you like, whoa, I have to sit down or I need a whiskey? Like what went through your mind on a non-scientific level, on a purely human emotional level? Well, a great little vignette that comes to mind was an evening in those days when I was, you know, I had just come home from the lab and, you know, we had just gotten the data that showed how this worked and... I was at home, I was, you know, I was cooking spaghetti in my kitchen for my young son, and I, I just suddenly burst out laughing because I, I thought, this is so crazy, you know, that, that we started working on this, this thing, didn't really know where it was going, and it, was, it certainly wasn't a popular area of science at the time. Most people had never heard of CRISPR, and yet we had uncovered this just absolutely extraordinary uh, molecule whose chemistry was going to probably change the world. Unlocking the mysteries of the genome has been a holy grail for scientists. And with CRISPR and other tools, humans have invented mechanisms to change evolution. But only recently have scientists begun to deploy these tools. And this next chapter is complex. There are so many questions. Will genetic treatments become everyday procedures? Should they be used to eradicate disease, revive extinct species, even help us live longer? And how can we make sure these tools work for the benefit of all humankind? And so today on the show, reshaping evolution because we are on the precipice of the next scientific revolution, one that could profoundly change humanity in exciting and frightening ways over the next century. Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier's work earned them the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020. And now their development of the CRISPR-Cas9 molecule is being tested in over a dozen clinical trials. Everything from sickle cell disease, beta thalassemia, which is another blood disorder, disorders of the eye, liver disease, heart disease, and um, muscular dystrophy. So it's just mind-boggling to think of a technology going from initial publication in an academic research journal to being widely deployed for so many different applications. Can we go back to uh, the blood disorder, sickle cell disease? My understanding is that a person's red blood cells are misshapen, and so that means they can't carry enough oxygen. That's right. And that's, that's why it's referred to as sickle cell disease, because when you look under a microscope, the cells have a classic sickled shape, and people with sickle cell disease make a, a form of the protein called hemoglobin that carries oxygen in the blood, that is prone to aggregation, prone to sticking together and forming uh, aggregates that lead to the, the sickle shape of the cells. And so how does CRISPR work to fix it? To treat sickle cell disease at its source, what's done is to remove what are called blood stem cells from an affected individual. These come out of the bone marrow. And they are cells that have the potential to develop into new red blood cells. And to ensure that they don't have the, the sickle cell trait, 
CRISPR can be used to either change the DNA of the affected gene, or they can actually suppress the effects of the sickle cell uh, gene mutation. And that's what's done. So the, 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 the uh, CRISPR is used to make those, those changes in blood stem cells, and then the edited cells are infused back into the patient where they can repopulate the bone marrow and effectively uh, replace their red blood cells with corrected cells. So just to be clear, you're saying that there could be a family that says, you know, we have passed down sickle cell to generation after generation, and we want it to end with us. Well, that's right. It it could, you know, and it's extraordinary. And even today, you know, this is something that is already being used in patients in these trials. Mm -hmm. Victoria Gray, she was actually the first U.S. patient to receive a CRISPR-based therapy for her sickle cell disease. And, you know, she's showing that this type of approach can actually work quite well in terms of treating a disease at its source. And I think that's really what CRISPR offers is that kind of, of a, a cure really for genetic disease. And I think it, it just paves the way for future applications of, of this technology as well, because of course, when you start to see success and, and you know, begin to, to see how patients' lives are, are being impacted beneficially by this technology. It's highly motivating to, you know, to carry it forward and, and see it used in, in, other, in other diseases. But I, I think one has to think about the fact that, um, you know, what we're talking about here is effectively changing evolution. You know, it's changing us at our core and going back to the instruction manual that makes us who we are and making changes there. When, when we talk about it in the context of a disease like sickle cell disease that is so debilitating, it, it certainly seems like this might be something that some families might want to consider eventually, if, especially if the technology is vetted carefully and, and shown to be safe. And by the way, we're not there yet. But I think the the broader issue really is equity, uh, access to technologies, who who decides about something like that, something as profound as that, who pays for it, um, who has access to it. I think it gets complicated quickly. Yeah, I mean, it goes from stopping a fatal disease to maybe optimizing for IQ or even, you know, being thin and tall and having a particular eye color, I suppose. I mean, in a most extreme case, you could imagine that someday couples, you know, go to a, an in vitro fertilization clinic and they receive a menu, right? And they can decide what types of, of traits they want for their, their children. Mm. Yeah, you actually brought that up back in 2015 in your TED Talk. Imagine that we could try to engineer humans that have enhanced properties such as stronger bones or less susceptibility to cardiovascular disease or even to have properties that we would consider maybe to be desirable, designer humans, if you will. Right now, the genetic information to understand what types of genes would give rise to these traits are mostly not known. But it's important to know that the CRISPR technology gives us a tool to make such changes once that knowledge becomes available. This raises a number of ethical questions that we have to to carefully consider. And um, this is why I and my colleagues have called for a global pause in any clinical application of the CRISPR technology in human embryos to give us time to really consider all of the various implications of doing so. That was more than six years ago, but not everyone stuck to a moratorium. Overnight, an astonishing claim. A scientist in China saying he created the world's first genetically engineered babies. A line has been crossed that should not have been crossed. It's very disturbing. It's inappropriate. Oh, this is huge. In a moment, more from Jennifer Doudna about the ethical implications of CRISPR. On the show today, reshaping evolution. I'm Manoush Zamarodi, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. We'll be right back. This message comes from NPR sponsor Policy Genius. Have a family? 
A good life insurance plan is important. Your family needs protection to cover expenses if something happens to you. Policy Genius helps you find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Manoush Zamarodi. On the show today, reshaping evolution. We were just talking to Nobel Prize winning biochemist Jennifer Doudna, whose work on CRISPR marked a new chapter in our ability to alter our DNA. In 2015, Jennifer called for an international moratorium on applying CRISPR to human embryos, at least until the scientific community considered all the ethical implications of gene editing. That was definitely a motivation at that time was to call to the attention of everyone to just be aware that this technology does have the potential to create these very profound, you know, kinds of changes in human beings. What happened next was that there was an announcement in 2018, which was actually actually happened at the second international summit on the topic of human genome editing of a project in China in which two embryos had been edited using CRISPR and then were implanted to create a pregnancy. Uh, that resulted in the birth of twin girls with edits to their DNA. And do you remember what your reaction was after he presented his research? Well, it was pretty horrifying. You know, it was um, just kind of shocking to see the way that the work had been performed. It just just really a, an example of unethical behavior on the part of a scientist, you know, just rushing forward with something before it had been tested to be safe and and also without properly understanding how to how to explain and consent uh, with patients, you know, to, to explain to them what was actually happening to the embryos that they were using in the, in the study. And so I think it really did galvanize the international community to realize that this type of work really shouldn't be happening right now. And there has been a, a concerted effort on the part of not only scientific organizations, but also by the World Health Organization and the United Nations to get involved in in this conversation. Okay, so you've got governments and NGOs talking, but of course, there's the other party that we're not talking about yet, which is private enterprise. There are a lot of companies who are hoping to make money off of this technology. You've started several companies that are developing CRISPR-Cas9 treatments, But should we be worried? Because companies are not always known for taking the moral high ground, right? You're right that I think this is always something that needs vigilance. One has to, you know, you can't relax. You have to remember, you know, there's there's always the risks that go along with a technology like this. Um, But companies play an incredibly important role in all of this because generally this is not something that academic labs have the funding or the resources to do. And that's where companies come in. So how do you balance your business interests with your ethics? I think it begins at the at the beginning. You have to start with uh, creating a culture in your team that uh, focuses on ethical use of, of the technology and on the you know benefit that can be created by developing it in the context of the company. And um, and we've you know certainly I've been proud of the the teams that I've been involved with uh, as a founder that I think in each case, these are are people who I like, I trust. I think we have aligned uh, values, core values in terms of both doing uh, excellent science and and, um, and doing it with an eye towards ethics and um, appropriate use of a a powerful tool. Your biographer, um, Walter Isaacson, has said that you're Uh, invention of CRISPR heralds the beginning of a next great innovation revolution. What what do you think he means by that? There's a lot of of evidence that we're entering an era in biology in which we have increasingly at our fingertips a collection of tools that allow manipulation of biological systems in controllable ways. 
those capabilities will advance, you know, the kinds of, of things that have only been dreamt of in biological systems to a point where we can actually achieve them. Mm -hmm. Imagine that uh, someone gets a diagnosis for something. Maybe it's even pre-diagnosis. It's they've gone to a company like 23andMe or, or Color Genomics and they have their DNA sequenced and the result comes back that they have susceptibility to Alzheimer's disease in the future. Today, that's kind of, you know, information that's not directly actionable. Whereas imagine in the future, it's possible to use a technology like CRISPR to change those genetics so that um, that person is no longer uh, has that susceptibility. That would be extraordinary if we get to that point. Will we get there in 30 years? I don't know, but I think it's, I think it's entirely possible that we will. That's biochemist Jennifer Doudna. You can see her full talk at TED.com. On the show today, reshaping evolution. How recent medical advances may allow us to defeat some of today's most debilitating illnesses. Imagine you're having some strange symptoms and you don't really know what they are. This is Nabia Saklayan. You're feeling a lot of tremors, your muscles are stiff, you're having difficulty thinking and understanding, and you go to your doctor because you want to know what's going on. And they run tests, a whole host of them. They order neurological exams, look at your family history, measure your agility, muscle tone, balance, and then... And then you find out that you have Parkinson's disease, which is devastating news. And I've had family members who've had to go through that. And it's a very, very tough moment to realize you have something that's going to completely change your life and you might have these symptoms forever. Today, your doctor would review your options with you, medications you can take, lifestyle changes to make, how to manage a disease which has no cure. But, but Nabia is working towards a different outcome. What if I told you there is a different future ahead for us. What if your doctor, instead of saying, okay, we're going to be treating your symptoms, your doctor actually says, no, we're going to be able to cure this disease. And the way that works is you drop off a blood sample, those blood cells are shipped off to a cell factory to generate brand new neurons that are customized just for you. You come back the next week and a surgeon transplants those neurons into your brain and you just received a cure for Parkinson's. Okay, wait, let me, let me see if I get this right. Take some blood cells, turn them into new neurons, put them in the right places in the damaged part of the brain, and you can essentially cure par Parkinson's? Exactly, yeah. I mean, Nabia, I gotta say, it sounds like science fiction. It does sound like science fiction, but what's amazing is most of the pieces of the puzzle have been figured out. We know how to make patient-specific cells. We know how to transplant them into the right part of the brain. We've seen these transplants happen in patients, and the results are very, very promising. And now we just have to figure out manufacturing. How do we make these cells in a fully automated way, make them super cheap? And that's what I'm working on with my team. For years, we've heard that stem cells may eventually cure diseases and treat illnesses, that by genetically engineering them, they could fix our ailing bodies. Now, though it's still early, promising new technologies are getting us closer. In labs like those at Nabia's company, Salino. We're automating the generation of personalized human cells, and these cells can be used for a range of therapeutic applications. And because they're 100% your cells, your immune system is extremely unlikely to reject or attack those cells. Nabia Saklayan picks up this idea from the TED stage. In fact, the body has no idea that these cells were actually made in a cell factory. All of this is possible because of a breakthrough at the intersection of biology, laser physics, and machine learning. We'll start with biology. The human body is an absolute miracle. Trillions of cells are working in synchronicity to pump blood, secrete dopamine, and let me see and speak to you right now. 
But as we age, our cells age too. That's why our skin starts to sag, our cartilage wears away, and your five-mile run might turn into a 20-minute walk. Yes, we're all getting older. Our bodies are ticking time bombs. But stem cells could offer a solution. All right, so stem cells, remind us, why are they so useful? Yes, stem cells are these very special cell types that have the code in them to become any cell type in the body. In our natural state of existence, we don't have absolutely 100% pure stem cells in the body anymore because they've evolved into becoming different subsets of cells in the body. But uh, it's possible now to generate really high-quality stem cells for each and every patient, for each and every adult, that look very much like embryonic cells. Scientists can make stem cells. Absolutely. They're called induced pluripotent stem cells. And these stem cells open up the possibility to generate neurons on demand, heart cells on demand, skin on demand, hair on demand, you name it. You can make any cell type where we know the biology of how to change the stem cell to the target cell type. Now, unfortunately, stem cells are notoriously difficult to engineer. One fundamental problem relates to how they're made, which involves taking a patient's blood cells and adding chemicals to those blood cells to turn them into stem cells. Now, during this chemical process, you never end up with a perfect set of stem cells. In fact, you get a very messy plate of cells going in different directions towards the eye, brain, liver, and every random cell must be removed. Until recently, the main way to remove cells was by hand. I remember the first time I visited the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. I watched a highly skilled scientist sitting at a bench, looking at stem cells, evaluating them one at a time, and removing the unwanted cells by hand. It's a slow, tedious, and artisanal process, which is why generating a personalized stem cell bank today costs about $1 million. Right now, there are phase one slash two clinical trials, one that's already launched in the U.S. for personalized iPSC-based therapies. All of these groups have made enough patient-specific stem cells and therapies and derived tissues by hand. And that's maybe Hmm. 10, 15, or 20 patients. That's it. It, That's it, right. So when you think about a phase three trial, you may need hundreds of patients, and there literally aren't enough scientists that can Hmm. make those cells by hand. And of course, it becomes very, very expensive. Running a phase three clinical trial would cost $300 million, which is not feasible in most instances. Okay, and this is where presumably your work comes in, Nabia. Yes. So when I came into the biology space, so just a quick background, I'm a physicist by training. When I started my PhD, I joined a laser physics lab because lasers are the coolest. But I also decided to dabble in biology. I started using lasers to engineer human cells. And when I talked to biologists about it, they were amazed. Here's why. Scientists are always looking for ways to make biology more precise. Sometimes cell culture can feel a lot like cooking. Take some chemicals, put it in a pot, stir it, heat it, see what happens, try it all over again. In contrast, lasers are so precise. You can target one cell, millions, at precise intervals, every second, every minute, every hour. I realized that instead of doing this tedious process of stem cell culture by hand, we could use lasers to remove the unwanted cells. And to automate the entire process, we decided to use machine learning to identify those unwanted cells and zap them. Here's how it works. Take some blood cells, put it in a cassette, add chemicals to those blood cells to turn them into stem cells, like always. Now, instead of having a human look for those unwanted cells and remove them by hand, the machine identifies the unwanted cells and zaps them with a laser. As you can see, this entire process happens by machine. The computer decides when and how often to prune the cells and uses a fully automated system to run the process. After repeated pruning, you end up with a perfect culture of your stem cells, ready to be 
banked and used at any time. Nabia, we talked about how hypothetically a brain with Parkinson's could be repaired using stem cells, iPSCs. But to be clear, stem cells are already being used to to treat leukemia and other types of blood cancers. I've, I've also read about them being used to restore a patient's eyesight in clinical trials. So, so far, it seems pretty promising. Yes, and just this past month, there's been an amazing result that was put out into the world by the Vertex team where they tested one patient with a dose of new insulin-producing cells And this patient is not having to use insulin injections anymore. So that has happened in the past month, and it's tremendous. And now it's all about figuring out what is the right format for the specific cell therapy, how many cells should be transplanted, how to get around the immune evasion problems, and how to manufacture these cells in a scalable and cost-effective way. That's what we need to figure out. But we're going to do all of that in the next 10 years. I have so much confidence we are as an industry. Perhaps you have longevity in mind. That is certainly a possibility. In the future, we might use these exact same stem cell banks to generate entire new organs, new tissues, new skin, new bone. This technology also has the potential to revolutionize personalized pharmaceuticals. Today, taking medicine is to some degree trial and error. You don't really know if the drug is going to work for you until you put it in your body. But what if we had a miniature human replica of you with your cells? Eye cells, brain cells, heart cells, muscle cells, blood cells on a chip. A miniature human replica of you. We could take the drugs, test them on the cells in the lab first to see how it works. If it works, fantastic. Go ahead and take the drug. If it doesn't, pharmacists can order up custom drugs just for you. You know, there was a time that if you were diagnosed with smallpox, I mean, that was it. It was fatal. But now, of course, smallpox is gone. It's been eradicated In the future, do you think that, is that how we're going to think about diseases like Parkinson's and diabetes if or when we have these stem cell treatments? Will these illnesses be so easy to cure that a diagnosis won't really feel as devastating or life-altering as it does now? I do think there is a possibility to create a world where these diseases don't feel as burdensome as they are today. However, I do want to mention also, this brings me back to a lot of thoughts I have about accessibility in healthcare and how do we make these cell therapies accessible. Mm. It really comes down to how cheap can we make these advanced therapies. You know, getting a cell therapy could be just as expensive as buying insulin or taking penicillin or taking painkillers. That would be Hmm. what is my aspirational goal for the future. But we have so much, so much work to do to get there because making cells is so complex. But I, I am very optimistic we're going to get there because what's happening right now in bioengineering is many different disciplines are coming together and trying to solve these big problems in new and creative ways. Nabia Saklian is the co-founder and CEO of Salino Biotech. On the show today, Reshaping Evolution. I'm Anush Zamarodi, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Stay with us. Hey, if you're looking for a way to support our show and public media, I hope you will consider signing up for the NPR Plus podcast bundle. You can listen to a bunch of NPR podcasts, including this one, without any sponsor breaks. And you can even access behind the scenes episodes from some of your favorite shows. Go find out more at plus.npr.org. And thanks. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Anoush Zamarodi. And today on the show, reshaping evolution. Can breakthroughs in altering and controlling our genes herald the next scientific revolution? 
and it's not just for humans, but for animals too. Take a little creature named Elizabeth Ann. Elizabeth Ann is the most beautiful black-footed ferret. She has dark eyes, little pink ears, and white whiskers. And she's also kind of a genetic miracle. She was cloned from a cell line that uh, had been preserved 30-plus years ago. That's what's amazing about her. Ryan Phelan is the co-founder and executive director of Revive and Restore. We're a nonprofit based in California 